thank you for putting up with the heat, the humidity, and hopefully I brought it. I will take it back when I go on Sunday. It's supposed to be in the 50s overnight. Yeah, and no rain. So, thank you for bearing with me and everyone else. What a great event out here at Kempton's. So, uh, I have to, after you look over the pattern and everything, I have to explain a bit about that pattern and its evolution. I was hoping to have a whole bunch of youngsters and people here because we need to get the uh, new people, the young ones, involved in this whole operation, whether it's working a long rifle, whether it's working horns, reenacting. The history is so important. And with this, the pattern, sort of an interesting way it came, about, uh, came about. It's the evolution of the pattern is uh, interesting. Back in 2009, I had a, uh, was on a winter break from my job at around Christmas, and National Muzzle Loading Rifle Association had an article in Muzzle Blast. I leafed through it when I got opened the mail, and oh, this is sort of neat. Yeah, great articles in it. And came across this one that uh, Muzzle Blast ran on a bag pouch hunting pouch from Wallace Gessler. And I started to read, and when I read more and more and more, this pouch that you see, in an illustrated photograph for the article, 1753 or thereabouts came out of Virginia. And I said, wow, is that neat? It's an old original bag. And I think I can make one of these. So I did. And since we've got a short group here, small group, this is the one I came up with. If you want, just pass it around and we'll throw it on the table when everyone has seen it. Go ahead. You got people behind, so make everyone take a look at this. Hey, Chuck. Yeah. Can you use the microphone. Oh, okay. Mr. Ron Bourne. He, from our relationship in Indiana and Connor Prairie and the stuff that we've done, I was allowed to go through his collection of original leather pouches, different flavors, different sizes and everything. But the one thing that came and became clear for an Eastern hunting pouch, there's, you know, they're not like a artillery haversack for a Gettysburg, that size, no, they're small. You have your horn, you have your rifle, and you need some tools to make the rifle work for you. And they aren't large. So, back to the bag that's going around. I'm going to call it a bag. I'll call it a pouch. And what this is, I took Wallace's photograph. He did give me some dimensions in that article. Ooh, now I know the size of it. So I measured the photograph. And I'm not sharp with mathematics. Don't ask me to get, get, do nuclear bombs or uh, anything like that. Uh-uh, bad. No, you don't want me to do it. So what I did, I did some proportions 
and came up with the size of that bag that you have there that's going around. Okay, put it away. It was out here at Dixon's at one point in time, came back home a few years back before COVID. Daughter-in-law said, uh, B, can you help me out with uh, the Girl Scouts uh, that I have here? She said, we'd like to do a leather project, something similar to that hunting pouch that you made. Yeah, okay, we can do this. So I thought about it, fumbled around, played with it. All right. Came up with an idea, the same pattern that I used for that uh, hunting pouch, the one, the Wallace Gussler. Go ahead and get this one going. I said, we need something simple, an easy way for people that have never stitched, cut leather, work things with leather, can do it, especially when you have 10 year olds and eight year olds and kids and you know, they get you successful. So I came up with the pattern that you have in your hands last year I did a two piece <laughs> I said I'm not going to do have you assembly required this but I had the, uh, the patterns printed uh, that you have now and that's the pattern off of that uh, bag there so here we go why is a pattern so important? Because that's your roadmap of how you're going to work this thing up so you can transfer it to the material and make your whole process go easier. Because believe me, after many years, uh, I have made enough mistakes and uh, you know, at the very beginning, you don't want to, you, you want to be successful. You want to do this. So anyway, the process that I'm going to uh, work with you on is very, very simple. With your pattern in front of you, trying to grab mine too. Oh, shoot. Excuse me. Everyone got one. Okay, everyone set. If you notice on this pattern, there's a real distinct line. It's the center line. Make a successful pattern, everything has to be symmetrical and everything sort of revolves around the center line here. And once everything is laid out and you're ready to go, what you're gonna do is transfer that center line over onto the material that you're going to use. And that's why I made a distinct center line here for you to use. There's some other interesting places, especially on this pattern. When you get it cut out, ready to go, down here where the front flap and the back panel come together and the fold marks. I'm going to mark those too. Now, let's 
somebody would like. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Tools. What do you use? First of all, I'm going to introduce you to some leather shears. I am doing, now these aren't leather shears, these are CBS shears. Use these to cut out your paper pattern. The reason I'm saying use cheap pair and make sure that they're good and sharp is to, on paper, the leather shears, don't use those on paper or cardboard or anything like that. And so we'll do all our paper cutting with these. Cut this pattern out. Okay. You go around everything and do... Lines are your friends on patterns. Make sure you follow these things and get up, you know, pay attention. You know where the center line is. And leave everything there. Go around the pattern. Cut it out. Now, great. We've got the pattern cut out. What do we do with the pattern? Well, we're going to apply it to the material. How do you select leather? Wow. You know, well, I can go out and uh, uh, I have the opportunity to grab some uh, people down the street that have leather that they use for harnesses, bridles, that type of thing. And you're going to notice some things. Okay. I'm going to have one of these go one way and the other. They're both the same. I'm going to explain a little bit about the material that we're going to be using. On the resource list, uh, especially the one from Wicket and Craig, the little card there at the top, and uh, also the Booth, and Com or, uh, uh, Booth of England, uh, is some sizing of leather sort of important when you're building stuff. When you hear the term, an ounce of leather, that works to 1 64th of an inch. Okay, so, hmm, eight ounces, eighth of an inch. That's pretty thick stuff. So, you're going to see some different samples in the, these packages of the leather that I'm going to introduce you to. And we'll keep those out wandering around. That's great. Is there air? Uh, Wicket and Craig, Pennsylvania company that's been around since 1869, one of the few tanneries in operation here in the U.S., is up in Kerwinsville, Pennsylvania. And wow, what a neat deal that is to go see the process. So call them up there and say, hey, we, we've got a bunch of people that want to see how you make a real old dead leather into something usable. And boy, do they need to do a great job. I use, I, I must say something. Wicket and Craig, I use them when I'm making portmanteaus. These guys, these rolly things. Uh, when I'm doing haversacks, artillery's haversacks for people, uh, like down in Gettysburg and a few other places. And, uh, you know, my heavy duty stuff comes from there. The other leather, that I'm fond of is from Booth and Company. That's the 
next part of the resource list. And this is called the kip. And it's uh, in between a calf and a cow. They're smaller. They come in from Africa, uh, through England, and then over here to the U.S. Oh, keep those out. You know, if anyone wants to take those home, <laughs> they sent me a ton of them. Uh, yeah, just for reference. But uh, you're welcome to them after, after you get uh, over with. So, leather. Now, Chuck, that leather that you made, this out of, for the simple Girl Scout elementary, eight-year-old uh, eight bag and that I'm introducing you to, doesn't look like anything you got on the table up here. No, I had a piece of bark can deer hide, little guy. I said, well, in order to make this project, I've got this laying around here. Why not do it out of that? So this is the bark tan. Wow, did the kitchen smell real great for about three months. Yeah, mmm, smelled like I was doing barbecue all night long and all day. Yeah, no, I didn't. I found it down at Connor Prairie when I went down for a show. I'd love to find more of it, and I can't. And uh, it's so fun, so easy to work with. And, uh, you know, you can use brain tan. How many of you guys hunt? No people that do? Great. Talk to them. See if you can get it. Uh, uh, if you know anybody that uh, actually does tanning, bark tan, brain tan, see, you know, put your order in for a hide because it's fun to work with. And you get a rustic looking thing too. That looks old timey. That it's been around the block or up and down the mountain or in the gullies, you know, for quite some time. Oh, that's impressive. Anyway, so that is where the pattern that you have ended up. Now, of course, all the accoutrements and all the uh, high-tech stuff like the knife, the horn, and the, the little uh, pieces that brushes to clean the pan and to poke uh, the uh, touch hole out with. Wow, you can include those when you're done. The sky's the limit, but you got to get started somewhere. Okay, everyone cut up that pattern. You got, you got your pattern all cut out and you're ready to go. Selecting the material, if you get a chance, go by the Horn Guild booth up there because they have a replica made out of linen, canvas, Russia linen, hemp, whatever, that uh, Bouquet and Forbes ordered up for the march out here to Pittsburgh. And uh, take a look at that. It, it, you can buy tickets on it too. And uh, yeah. There we go. Here. Anyone else coming in? Okay, I'll leave those there. But, we've got the pattern all cut out. We've got, we know from the pattern where our center marks are, where the important little special marks are, I call them, for the folds, for things where they meet up and everything. We know where those are going to go. They're all marked out. Before we do any marking, I want you to do something with that pattern. With that center line, fold the pattern lengthwise after it's all cut out. Fold it over and see if all your lines match up. 
because when you're cutting in, you'll make little divots and dents, and maybe it, in the, this part of the pattern will be a, a bit larger with it folded up, sort of like trimming out paper dolls. You can trim off the excess, and then when it comes open and lays flat on the material that you're gonna go with, you know you got it. Okay. Oh, Chuck, how do we trace the pattern? How do we get it over? Uh, to go on to the leather. Bad. Ballpoint pens are bad. Stay away from these things. Bad. Because you can never get the lines off of the material after everything's put together before you finish the project out. So you got X's and lines and all sorts of things. Forget those. Personally, when I'm working with all the materials, now, This is my toolbox. Maybe. There we go. It's not a portmanteau. This is a midi manteau. Never mind. <laughs> Scratch off. Ooh. Lay my pattern onto the leather, the piece that I'm going to work on. And I use pet rocks at home. Sort of heavy pet rocks, about four of them. And I'll put them on my pattern just to hold that on top of the leather. And then I will scribe carefully around that line around until I got everything scribed out. That scratch all, I'll take, and you know those center marks and those indicator marks that I just talked about? Ah! Stab. Now you have a permanent mark where that center mark at the top, bottom, sides, wherever you need it, is in your leather. You can use pencils, and in the box here, I do have a pattern that I penciled out. That's how I do it. And by doing it that way, now, ooh, don't use the scissors that you cut out the cardboard with because the worst thing that you can do is cut paper with scissors because of all the clay in the paper and cardboard. Ugh. You want to keep your leather shears only doing leather. Don't use them for screwdrivers or paint can openers either. Not good. Keep these priority. You know, keep them dedicated for cutting out old pieces of dead animal parts only. Okay, your pattern's transferred. Everything's put together. You've ready to cut it out. You've cut out your pattern with the shears. Okay, how do you make, how, you know, when you get everything cut out, how do you make these, everything stick together? Oh, we're going to do a thing called sewing. Oh, Chuck, when you do your bags, do you use a machine? No. It's called saddle stitching. 
and it, it's great therapy once you get on to the routine. No, it's fun. You can have a riot with this thing because you can get some really great pieces put together in really not a very long time to do it once you get practicing. Like Dave said for shooting, practice, practice, practice. Okay, I'm gonna put the microphone down for a minute and I'm gonna pass a couple things around. Uh, everyone have a chance to look at the, the combination leather samples. If those are back, if they're both back, get them out there again because on those, there are some stitching in spacing marks. You gotta look care uh no, I'm sorry, these guys. Oh yeah, get them out there. Keep them floating. Yeah, send one, if both are there, send one group over there, one group, oh yeah, there they are. Because we'll keep those out floating uh, while we're going through this thing. Sort of important. Yeah, get them out and we'll go from there. The next thing after this whole project is all cut out, Mark, ready to go. We have to locate where we're going to run the stitch. On the pattern, I've used dots. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a tool called a stitching groove. And they're on the boards here. You can get a, a, a yeah, we'll pass a, that thing around again. What it is, is, is an L looking guy. It's on the board there. I've, I've got one bound up from candy. Can everyone see that? I can pass it around if you'd like me to, but it falls apart because this is adjustable up here. And how close or far away that part of the L will give you where that stitch line is going to be run. And what it does, it creates a groove in the leather. And the pieces that are going around, I put stitch grooves on those. I've got different spacings and everything. Keep those things floating around. Don't, don't bring them up here until this is all over because you're going to refer to those samples. I wish I had made more. And I'm going to do this. Now, what's important? One thing that you got to keep in mind, because it will continue all through the project. Always start at the bottom and work to the top. There's a reason you'll see in a minute. But if we start at that fold, bring our stitch marks up to where the fold is for the front flap, from here to here, here to here, here to here, and here to here. Now, this is where we're going to locate our stitches. Indenting. I've got on the uh, pattern here, eighth of an inch is great. I, on, on the uh, deer hide, I went three sixteenths on setting up my 
stitching Gruber before I ran those lines. Okay, now, what do we do now? Leave them out, uh, keep them floating. Keep them out there on the floor. There are a couple different tools out there. Oh, these are overstitch wheels or stitching wheels. And they're a circular thing with bumps on it. So after these grooves are all put in, you take your leather and you follow the line that you just made and you push down and it leaves little marks. And you'll see it on those samples that are going around. What fun. Okay, they come in many different flavors. You can get them. I've got some that are clear down to 12 inches per stitch. Uh -uh. Now, for this stuff, normal for doing all these pouches here, seven or eight counts per stitch. Some of the really big stuff, where it's real thick, eight, nine ounce material, uh, I will go in and stitch maybe a five or a six count per inch because it's bigger. The material thickness is, wow, you got a quarter of an inch there of material. You know, when you got two pieces of eight ounce material together, that's hmm, eight, quarter of an inch, right? Two eighths together? Okay. Playing. But, wow. Okay. We've got all the little lines put together. We've got little markings where we're going to do something with all those little markings. And that is where a couple of other tools come in the process. You can be like me. I guess maybe I'm masochistic by heart or something. No, but seriously, this is the tool of the trade right here. It's a stitching hole, a sharp pointy thing. And this I will use to make the holes. There's another way. Now, with eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, you notice I've been using shears, I've been using, uh, you know, trying to keep it simple so they don't poke themselves in the eye or eviscerate themselves with certain things. And we're gonna use, and on the board here, there is a set of, they're called stitching chisels, diamond stitching. They're all in the package in a Ziploc bag. But take a look at that, send that around again. And with youngsters, now, would you rather give them a stitching all or a scratch all to make their holes with? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Not me. Oh, we want to do my girl shot troop or pack whatever we got six or seven kids can you imagine this stuff flying around show you something a round knife it's sharp literally on all edges this is what i use to cut the thickest material with down to the deer hide that I work with? Uh-uh. No. Have a lot of respect for this because when this knife is used, 
it's a forward motion. You don't want body parts out in front of where you're going because sometimes it skips. Uh, one of my mentors says, always keep all your body parts behind the knife when you're using it. Talk to somebody, work with people that have used these just so you get comfortable with them. Not gonna get about to a seven or eight year old. <laughs> so, how do we get the holes in the letter? With the stitching, diamond stitching chisels. As I told you before, start at the bottom. Now, you're gonna have to fold everything up. Now you should have So much fun to, the patterns. Once, once you start to make them, you know, a little later on, you don't need to fold yours up right now, but I'm using this for demo. But see what I've done? I've made the fold where I've got fold lines. I've also marked on this, start stitching here and here and work to the top of the bag. Work this way, work up. Good idea. So when you're done, you should have, using the stitching chisels, a mallet, a brick, uh, a hard piece of wood just to drive them through the folded up piece of leather. Now we have this and everything's cut out. Using the stitching chisels, you start the point down here. And what's neat about those guys is you can overlap the smaller stitching chisels. You can go around tight curves. And then on the long runs on the big straights, sort of like uh, Indy out there where I'm from, you know, you can really Put on the big ones, the like six, eight count stitching chisels, and put these together. So, we get up here, we get up here, we got the front, and the front panel and the back panel put together, sort of starting to look like old stinky here. All right, we've got the front panel, the back panel. Now, what do we do with this guy? That's the front flap. Look what's going to happen. All one piece. Two stitch lines, basically, to get this thing so it's cemented together. Somebody will say, well, how do you keep the leather from creeping and bouncing all around? bring out my pet rocks again, or document clamps. You know those little snappy things that you hold documents together with, like I've got here. Those clothespins. Wow, I tell you, the spring clamps that you buy, you know, at the uh, hardware stores and stuff, even big ones. In certain instances, I've actually used them on these things. You know, really, uh, they put dents in their project. I wouldn't recommend. The little document clamps are great because you can work a few holes uh, or indicator marks ahead of your stitching chisels. And once you do that, you work all the way up to the end. Now everything's put together, it's all flat. You've got holes in both sides. Can we use glue to glue it together? No. That, that ranks up there with me, I'll use it. Contact cement for very, very special occasions. And if I got time, what I will do is show you where we use it. 
comes in handy, but bad. Not nailing stuff together on this. Glue gets all over everything, and it has bad things happen in the future on the project. I really wish they, oh, next year, suggest that they wire me. You know, free up the mic here. Let's see, the samples are going around. The ones that are put together, those conglomerates that I made. But how you put things together is with a saddle stitch. What's a saddle stitch? I'm putting the mic down and starting to yell. You can take these apart when they get around to you and see if you can do it. You work with two needles. Saddle needle, harness needle. They're blunt, which is a good thing. Your threads, which are listed on your resource list, and indicated on those uh, leather pieces that conglomerate uh, going around, what I use is a four cord linen thread. And the harness needles are big enough that you can get the thread through the harness needle on both of these. Now you got this long guy. It's about so big. Usually, how long do you list? I, I've seen people say, oh, it's three times the uh, diameter of the project. Now, I yeah, you get 40 foot of line, you got it around your foot, you got it around your telephone, whatever, it's not fun. So, I usually, I've got short arms, some of you guys that are taller and have a reach. Uh, boy, are you going to get mileage when you do this. Two needles together. I have a hole here. I want to go through this hole. I normally would take my right hand and stick the right needle through the hole. Okay. Huh. Well, what do you do with this one? Okay, I'm going to bring the left hand with the other needle through this hole. And Okay, I've got a stitch made. Now, I need another stitch. Right hand through. The left hand brings that. The left hand comes in and puts that one together. Now I've got two stitches. The beauty of a saddle stitch. Ooh, this is so exciting, I'm gonna do three. And I'll have three stitches. Right through, same hole with the left one. Oh, now I got three stitches. Isn't that pretty? Oh, isn't that amazing? Beauty of a saddle stitch is unlike a machine stitch, it doesn't come apart. You know, when you break a, a, a break a thread like you do on your jeans or your shorts, you know, you, like uh, 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 doing your zipper. You know, zip, you know that, that whole thing is gone. This you can repair, too. And uh, as far as the pieces on the portmanteaus, that's a mini manteau. That's a maxi manteau. That's a port manteau. And 
that guy has seen some time. It's been around 20 years or better. All and stuff like what I'm doing here and other material. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to pass this guy. This will keep everyone entertained for at least a day or so. And wow! I even got one with needles on it. Look at that. Whoa. I'm going to take the needles off. Should use them as pointers. Probably help out. I will. And I'll pass this guy around. Take it apart and see if you can do what I just did. But right needle to the hole that you want to make and then come back to the same hole with the left one and then you don't have to put the Godzilla grip on this. Uh -uh. You just want to go snug and with the diamond shaped hole that's in the two pieces of leather what it does is bind everything up and locks that stitch in, sucks it in. Now remember, you've cut a groove in there. Your leather is sort of groovy now. And what that stitch is going to do, it's going to suck into that stitching groove. And that will help form that stitch internally. And also give it a bumper out here so that stitch is not torn apart. So, okay, get that one going around. Boy, we got more stuff going around. Okay. Chuck? Yeah? There's no knot at the end. No, there isn't a knot. It's just strictly friction that holds everything together. No, there's one going around. You come to the end of the line. Okay. Right here. You come to the end of the line, that last little hole. What do we do? Cut it off? No. What I'm going to do, I'm going to sneak attack on this thing. I'm going to attack it from the flanks. And I'm going to bring those two together, right and left. And I'm going to do a back stitch. That hole here. Here's the one that we're working on at the very end. We're gonna come back through that previous hole. Same way, left to right. And I don't, you wanna do it two times. You wanna have two back stitches. So what that's gonna do is bind everything together. Another trick that I do when I start my process down here at this hole, what I'll do is I will start the stitch, the one that, well, you missed the boat, you should go through this one. No, I start here, go through the stitch that I want to go through, same way, left to right, same hole. And then I'll come through. Now what I've done is make made a reverse back stitch. And then I'll run my line, stitch line, fill all the holes, get up to where we, your question. Okay. Now, they're all put together. Ooh, we got this thing all bound up. The reason I said, believe me, have I found this out. Everyone say, if you start down here and you get bubbles, deviations in stitching, deviations in the material, the way it lays, this up here, can easily take it off, trim it with your leather shears, and make it look tidy. But clean it all up, 
all the excess. But if you start up here, you get this big bubble down here. If anything goes wrong, you can always take it off, but you can't put it back on. So, here it is, old stinky. And, okay, what do you do now? Couple things. We haven't done anything with the staining, the dyeing. I haven't gotten there yet. Hopefully, how am I doing on time, everyone? Pretty good? I'm supposed to go at three. Get out of here. Two ways you can do it. If you want a rifleman's bag, put straps on. And this was sort of fun because this is all one piece of leather. I mean, as far as the deer that came off of it, you know, or gave it, you know, body parts for me, for when I got it, there we go. And darn, I didn't have enough to make the straps. If you were back 300 years ago, and you didn't have an extra deer and you had some extra leftover parts. See what I did? I stitched them together. Anyway, so that's how I handled that. If you got enough material, you can make straps. That's what I do. Here are the straps for the bag that's somewhere around here. And I use buckles, I use bone buttons. And if you pass these two around, you know, it's fairly simple. Attach, and then if you want some adjustments, use bone buttons, pewter buttons, buttons, and straps. Cut a radius, and so it fits. Locate it here. Yeah, it's on the pattern. It's not too hard to figure out. And I do the stitch groover around that radius. Very easily done. But I make a U stitch line. I don't join that U across the top because eventually what that's going to do it's a wear point. This is going to fall apart where that stitch goes across this way and then you got to take everything or the stitches all apart later on either cut new straps or adjust your length by whatever fell off and then can add buckles, not snaps. Okay, we have now a completed bag with these pieces of deer hide and this material. Wow, you've seen, and I want you to come up and play with these things when, when we're fine. But this is so simple, it's a place to start. And once you get it to this point, think about all the wonderful things that, sort of like buying a car. Look at this deal. I want to make, I don't like an envelope that you made there. Chuck, looks like an envelope. Well, now we can go and do additions. We can make it wider around to get more stuff in it. Can't have too little space for too much stuff. So you can do that. Got a better one. They're all up here. What did I do? Kill the mic? No, you're okay. Okay.
the addition. And once you get involved in this, by looking at patterns and seeing what's going on, say if you get Ron Bourne here to give up one of his originals, which I had the opportunity to do, I brought him in, took copious amounts of notes, you know, on dimensions, sizes, of, of stitch lines and stitching. Okay, reference point. Photograph the bag if I ever get the chance. If they'll let you, you could do a tracing around that bag to get the proper size. Talk to the owner because some of these things, you look at them and they vanish. Leather's not like cast iron some of the minutes. No. It's gonna go away. But when you do that, especially with your cameras on yourself, include a quarter in the photograph that you take of the specific part or area that you're working on. Because that you can use as a scale. Hmm quarter is roughly an inch, almost there. Okay, what is it, nine, nine, eight, five, six, whatever, depending on how much wear. But, you can start adding things to this pattern. You can modify the look of this pattern. And throw that out in the middle. Real world with it, that going around. Get another one going around, and we'll get that. Yeah, throw it down that side, trade it back and forth. Oh, yeah. John Proud picked this up from me about 10 years ago. This pattern looked familiar to everyone. Wow, the envelope. I made this bag, same pattern, with this cowhide, veg tan cowhide here. And polished and did some things. And I said, well, you know, the other one was great. A single bag. But I need a divider or something to separate the powder horns or day horn from the jewels. Ah, stay. But again, I just took that part of the pattern, expanded that, put it over here, And after I got it all cut out, now I've got a piece folding over once. This piece comes up, covers the back and the front of that internal piece. Take a, where do you go? Oh, take a look at this, because this is what you're gonna end up with without the divider in it. But it's a fold over, there's some tricks that I had to perform on it to get everything to fold together. After this side where the two pieces meet, I had leftovers, so I had to very, very carefully trim. This is fun. Pass that around. Okay, guess what I haven't talked about. Now you're there, if you got the straps on. Oh, by the way, look what you can do. No straps, but I have belt loops. Now this is an off the pattern that you got. Roughly, same size. Same basic size, a little shorter. It's for my turkey calls. And needed a belt pouch. There you go. You can do the same thing with this. Instead of putting straps on, 
pass this around and you'll get an idea of the belt loop that you can have. The sky's the limit. Please, come up, take a look at this stuff. Play with it. And, uh, I guess now we got to finish the leather. Quick question. Yeah. Did you touch on needle sizes? Yeah. For, depending on the, the uh, four chord, six chords, in there, I, I demonstrated some of the linen thread on those conglomerate pieces that are going around. If you look carefully, I've been using a number four. Stitching needles were tough to get a few years ago. On your resource list, you'll see on the back, Candy has a medium harness needle, which is real close to a number four, number three harness needle size. And that gives you an eye and gives you a link. If you want to see them, that's how I carry my needles. You want me to pass the set around? Do you believe me? Huh? Yeah. When I'm done, <laughs> keep everything together. Okay. Oops, I'm not going to give you a little bad. I'm looking for a set. Here we go. We can pass these around or it, it can come up. It might be. Yeah, keep them together. And these are the harness needles. But they're blunt. Believe me. They hurt. Because they're blunt. It's not like a regular sewing needle where it goes straight through. No. <laughs> It'll let you know that you screwed up when you're stitching, but hopefully you won't. Uh, the sizes that Candy has are uh, on the blue resource list. Yeah. And in lieu of not having the English needles of John James, I get mine from uh, over in England, and uh, sometimes if uh, uh, Booth has them, I'll get them there. Mm. There's other places, but yeah, and those are superior. I'll go through seven, eight projects or so. Yeah. Do you ever need to use a thimble to push it through the holes, or do they go through pretty easily? No. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, the stitching chisels on the entry hole put a fairly good hole in the material. Coming out, and it varies. This guy, the stitching hole, I'll chase maybe that hole out a little bit. Just go in, wiggle that, and go through, complete the stitch. And it varies. Uh, no. On that, that haversack, that artillery haversack, Get a pair of pliers with no rippings in the jaw. They make uh, electricians use them, hobbyists use them, flat faced. And then, if you need to, that, till I made some adjustments on the way I stitched, that was exciting. Yeah, I brought out the plier, brought them through. Not hard. You know, just to get that through. But if you use the flat face pliers, it doesn't tear up the needle. Yeah. Thimbles? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you're working. 
Yeah. You have it mentioned, do you wet the leather or do it dry? When you stitch? Yeah. No, I do it dry. Do it dry. Yeah, yeah. If I get into uh, some of the markings, I, you know, especially putting in that, the spacers, after I have run the groove around to get my groove line in, and I get ready to make the little marks for where I'm going to punch the holes, I'll take a Q-tip, a little water on it, and just go into that stitch groove line, and then run the stitching wheel, and it'll impress because that leather has been opened up, and you get a much visible, better uh, look at your project here. Okay, you ready to paint this thing up and make it look pretty? The, the, ah. mark, the mark of a good craftsman is you'll form a palace right here. Yeah. And you pick it when you pull it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In other things. Okay. Now, we've got our bag built. I stitch my project all together. There will be times where you'll dye the leather uh, before you start. And it all depends on how that project is arranged. But, everything's together. You got the flesh side. It's got the fuzzy feel to it. You got the slippery side, which is the grain side. I use Feebling's leather dye. And it's an alcohol-based dye. Get yourself some disposable gloves. Don't be a chuck. And wear them. Select the dyes. What's interesting, go to their website. They have a great color chart of all the dyes that they make. And select what you want to do. I'm partial to uh, three or four. And usually, I call them mainstream. And I'll get those dyes. And also, you can get them from the suppliers. Get some. Wooly dauber wool on a stick or piece of metal and don't do a chuck again um, uh, now I'm passing on to you guys you people out there what not to do because I've been there don't stick the dauber into the the quart of leather dye and get ready to pull it out. You'll have it all over the ceiling, floors, and there. Go to the grocery store, or when you go, and you buy some salad in the little containers, those plastic containers that you probably have 900 of around the house. Take one of those, pour the leather dye in that, because then you can... And what I'm going to tell you now, is sort of important for using those guys. The containers. When you do leather, do this. Get everything ready to go. You got your rubber gloves, you got your apron on. Hopefully you'll not be working in the kitchen like I do. And you got your daubers and life is good. So, do the inside first. Do the fuzzy side first. There's a reason, and I'll tell you in a minute. Get all that done. I open them up, go into all the nooks and crannies, and check everything, make sure that everything is ready to go. Do the strap the same way. Do the back of the strap, the fuzzy part. And then I'll walk away. And if you need to open or 
find a place to put the bag, find up perhaps an air or coke bottle. Hopefully it'll be empty. Flip the bag open, put it in the corner or someplace safe so it doesn't stain anything or fall over. Let it dry. Everyone says, okay, it's ready to go now after about a half hour. Feels dry, looks dry. Uh-uh, it ain't dry. I leave my stuff cook out dry for 24 hours. It's up to you after you practice and everything. After 24, now I come back to stain the exterior of the bag. Use a circular motion when you apply that dollar. Don't go straight up and down or vertically with it. Because you'll get streaks. Fleetings recommends circular motion. And do it liberally. Get the whole thing done and let it dry for another 24 hours. Because you've got Dye coming in from the flesh side, which really sucked it up. And dye coming in from the grain side, which doesn't penetrate as much. Everything meets up and you've got a good, good looking surface. I buff out with, uh, if the leather is sort of dry, use some neat foot oil, 24 hours on that. Give light it. Come back with a little more neat's foot to start to soften. Once everything is pliable and workable, top coating, and I'll go maybe saddle soap just to clean everything up. And then there's some dressings out there that you can put on. Montana Pitch Plant. I don't know who has it up here. I think there's someone. But that seems work if you're going to use it exterior. So, lay on the questions, if you would please, come up, look through this stuff. I, you know, with this small of a group, I think we've, uh, everyone got to see what's going around. Oh yeah, by the way, get a rubber band. I'll actually open it.